There we go. Hello. All right, we'll try it again. Um, <laughs> oh, my Lord. Just too many things to think about. I have to keep changing things back and forth. Hello. Good evening. Yes, I am wearing safety orange. So, you know, just in case any out of, out of control trucks were going to drive through my office, they will see me and avoid me. Um, I assume we've got everything up and going there. Okay, yes, sound is on. Sound is on. Yeah, I know. I just forgot to push the button because I had to change over at the last second because never mind. doesn't matter. But while we're on the subject of these sorts of things, um, let me mention to you that uh, we've had a few experiences in the last few weeks of where the stream gets cut off. Not quite sure why yet. Uh, doesn't seem to correspond to anything going on on our end. It may just be not a very good uh, ISP service or something. I don't know. Anyway, if it goes offline, if I suddenly disappear or whatever happens that happens on your end happens, um, don't go away. I will get it back up again. And we will assume that it will be the same thing as the last couple of times. Um, <laughs> Okay, I'm laughing just because I'm reading one of the comments here from Kristen. It says, I forgot to buy cheese. I don't know what to tell you. That 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 does sound bad. Uh, forgot to buy cheese. That is not a good thing. Okay, so I'm assuming that... Uh, <laughs> um, and Mahmoud says, why not try YouTube Live? I am going to try that. Um, I'm just not trying it at the moment. So um, it, it, as with anything, I want to try it in such a way that it will not interfere with an actual broadcast. So I'll have to do a test. I'm talking to Chris about it. Uh, Chris has sent me some suggestions and some things like that. So it, the problem is not being ignored. It's just been piled onto a plate that's already very full. Um, so I, I will do it, and I'm going to see if we can get a better and more... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? A more trustworthy arrangement in terms of things going on. But until that point in time, um, we're just going to muddle on the way we are. So if something like that happens, I'm just telling you, don't go away. Just check back to my Facebook page and I will restart a new stream. Uh, same, you know, tonight. I will restart this morning or whatever time it is for you. Anyway... Ah, I think that's it. Um, was there anything else I wanted to talk about? No, I'm just having a, you know, my regular live nervous breakdown, <laughs> which I have a couple of times a week. Um, but anyway, it's nice of y'all to be here. Um, I will be reading before too very long, I promise you. Um, anything to bring you up to date on? Just the normal, working, working on the book, working on various other things, dealing with domestic crises of various sorts. Um... Unfortunately, we had, uh, for the first time in several days, we had a downpour today, and uh, poor, poor large dog Johnny is unhappy. Um, he, he gave me that, that look, that whale eye look when I came downstairs or when I headed out to come downstairs, and as I left the room, he sort of rolled his eyes at me as if to say, yeah, sure, leave me here in a room where I can hear the rain. Um, and it's true, if he came down here where I am, he wouldn't be able to hear the rain. On the other hand, if he came down here where I am, he'd probably eat the cat sitting behind me. Um, and that would be bad for everybody involved. Uh, so that's not going to happen. So he's just going to have to tough it out upstairs. I think the rain has stopped now, though. So that's all good. That's all good. Um, small dog Walter continues to go swiftly mad, um, but that's nothing new. He's peripatetic. The dog is peripatetic. Um, if you don't know what that word means, you can look it up, but I'll save you the trouble and tell you it just means always in motion, always moving, always needing to do things. Um, there's a Stevie Smith poem that I may have mentioned to you guys in the past about the cat who galloped around doing good, and that is Walter. Walter is constantly galloping around. He has these plans and things happening that nobody knows about, but Walter... Um, he has a brain the size of a cashew, and uh, he has very long legs for a chihuahua. He makes little tick, 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 tick noises as he runs around on our hard floors. And he's always in motion. When I take the dogs out at night, 
um, to visit the backyard. Um, Walter will literally cover 20 times the amount of space that, that Johnny does, you know, and Johnny is a big dog in good condition, but Johnny just walks to where he needs to go. And then he walks back up. Meanwhile, in the interim, Walter has run circles around him, run circles, gone up and down the stairs several times, you know, down to where Johnny is back up to me, perched on the stairs, barking back up to the top, run around on the deck check to see if the door is open. No, it's not open. I have to wait for the large person to come and open the door. So I'll run back down and I'll bark at him. Then I'll bark at Johnny some more and then I'll run around in circle. I mean, it's, it's astounding. And this animal is now, God, he must be 12, 13 years old. So no longer a young spring chicken of a dog. And, and he eats like, you know, that much dry food. I mean, yeah, he gets the occasional scrap or something but I mean he just eats this tiny bird-like amount and yet he is in constant maddening motion you know he climbs up on the bed he's little he's small he's very skinny not as skinny as when we got him but he's still skinny and he always wants to be warm so he'll come climb up under the covers you know with whoever's on the bed or you know whoever it is anywhere but then like 15 seconds later, he's popped up again. He's like, what's going on? Something is happening here without Walter's permission. I will have to go and look. And then he's, and he's down and he's running back and forth and he's tick, tick, tick across the house, tick, 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 back and forth, tick, tick, tick. You can hear him. It's like the telltale effing heart, you know, it's just. Um, and then eventually he comes back and he gets up and he walks on your chest and he wants to get back under the covers again. And you reluctantly, you know, rearrange the covers and hold them up so he can get back under and he gets back under and he's there for maybe 60 seconds if you're lucky. And then suddenly he remembers that he has to go drink some water and he's <laughs> clambers out down the little dog steps to the floor and goes to the water bowl, drinks some water and wants to, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And when you combine it with the fact that I think he that I realized that he's barking and whining all the time, it's absolutely maddening. God bless. I love I love my dogs. I love them. My dogs. I would never get rid of them. I mean, they're, they're family, right? Uh, like the horrible cat behind me. They're they're family, and the whole thing about family is you're not allowed to throw them out until they reach a certain age, which dogs and cats never reach because they're dependent on you in a way that young adults are not. But nevertheless, it is absolutely maddening sometimes. Um, and I realize that love in all its variations, um, it, on the one hand, I have a distinct and complicated philo uh, scientific philosophy that love is the counter entropic force in the universe. On the other hand, it is also what keeps you shackled <laughs> to all the mistakes that you've made in your life. Um, so that's my philosophical thought for the night. Love is an anchor. Um, bless them. And uh, having a small mad dog and a large mad dog. Uh, uh, and I mean, in this sense, I don't mean mad dog like frothing at the mouth. I mean mad like crazy. Punishment to fit the crime of being a sentimental sent. Right now, I am going to see who might have shown up and left their names on here. Again, I can't read the comments because Facebook doesn't want me reading comments for some reason. They make it really difficult. I don't know why, but anyway, so um, here are the ones, and I can't, I don't know who the and five more are down at the bottom, but I see Cliff has checked in, so hello, Cliff, good to see you. Kristen, who checked in to let me know about the cheese thing, so thank you for that, Kristen. Jeremy, hello, Jeremy, good to see you. Anamika, a pleasure. And there is my mother-in-law, my dear mother-in-law, Hazel. Hi, sweetie, good to see you. Your daughter is fine. Um... She's asleep. That's all you need to know. It's that time of the night. She's asleep. Um, she has more sense than I do. She goes to bed early. She gets up early. She likes the cold, needle-sharp uh, light of morning. 
I, I've never figured that out, but you know, everybody is entitled. Um, oh, 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 God, I'm losing people off of this thing. So Maria Jose is here. Hello, hello. Jack is here. Hi, Jack. Good to see you. Um, skipping down here, Hazel. Sean, hello, Sean. Good to see you. Mahmoud, I already checked in with and said hello because Mahmoud was asking about whether I was going to move this to YouTube. Don't go away. Uh, Justin, hello, Justin. Good to see you. Chris, my friend, good to see you. Ilva, hello, darling. Petra, good to see you too. Ronnie, hello. Iris, good to see you. Dirk, hello. Stephanie, oh, that's a new name. Uh, Nikki, hello, good to see you. And seven more now, it says. So there's like a ton of people on that I cannot reach um, to see who they are and if they've checked in to say hello. Um, Vouter, okay, Vouter is one of them. Um, all right, so... Let us get back to what we were doing here. Go away. I don't want that. Get away. Cancel. 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 Okay, so I'm going to stay away from that. I am going to avoid this thing. And maybe if I move this off the side entirely, I can make sure I don't accidentally. <laughs> I don't accidentally cut it off, which is what I did the other time, I think, now. Although I'm not 100% certain about that. But let's not waste time talking about that crap. Um, anything else that I need to tell you folks about? Nah, just the usual. Um, everything about Facebook drives me mad. Um, if I was a more regular Twitter user, everything about Twitter would drive me mad. But um, because I've always kind of left that to Deb, who really used to like Twitter um, and was very active on it, I kind of let her do that so it didn't feel like I was impinging on her territory. Um, as a result, I kind of specify, I kind of, what's the word? I'm like, I kind of specialized on Facebook, um, which has now put me irredeemably in the category of poor, sad boomer. What the hell? That's life. Um, I, it's way too late to worry about being cool. I mean, I gave that one up sometime in the 90s, I think. Maybe even in the 80s. I don't know. It was a long time ago. Um, longer than some people have been alive. That's for darn sure. Uh, anything else I need to share with all of you folks? Oh, anyway, so, yeah, so, like, on Facebook, it, it literally, if you get, you know, when you when you have somebody ask to, to be befriended on Facebook, you know, it comes up and it goes, you know, one week, three weeks, six weeks, however long they've been waiting. And then when it gets to one year, it just stays there at one year until it hits two years, at which point it flicks over. I now have several people who've been on my waiting list for two years. Do I have any way of telling which ones have been two years and 11 months and which ones have been two years and two days so that I might perhaps pick the longer one who's been on the waiting list? Long? No, of course not. Of course not. That would be too easy. So not only does Facebook not want me to read the comments when I'm doing a live broadcast, um, but uh, they don't want me to be able to be good to the people who have asked to friend me online. So uh, clearly I have done something that has offended the, the great powers that be, our tech billionaires who run these things. Um, either that or they're just mean bastards. I'll let you figure it out. Um, what are we going to do? So I think I might as well just start reading because it's already 15 after. So um, we were, and I don't have much to say because again, I'm just, I'm working on Navigator's Children. I'm almost done. I'll probably be sending out the last 12, 13 chapters, whatever it is, in the next week or so to my readers, um, of whom a couple of them are online here tonight. Um, and... Yeah. Oh, and I just had a brilliant idea for a whole new something, and I can't figure out what it is yet or if I'm ever going to get around to writing it, but it's really a really cool, really obviously, I don't know, what, what do you call it? Not commercial, because God knows what's commercial these days, but I mean, it's definitely an idea. It's like a thing that you could explain it to anybody, and they go, oh, yeah, that's an idea. Yeah, 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 I can see that. Um, and whether anything will ever get done with it, I have no idea. But it just struck me the other day. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So 
we'll see whether it'll be a novel, whether it'll be a short story, whether it will be uh, one of those many things that just goes into the mental hopper and I never get around to. Who knows? I've still got several of those in there bouncing around, some of them from years ago. Um, and then every now and then I pull one out or every now and then I do an Otherland book and I find a way to use some of my old ideas that I hadn't previously found a way to, to actually turn into something. Anyway, so we are reading The Dragonbone Chair. We are reading Chapter 41, Cold Fire and Grudging Stone. The dream gradually receded, melting like mist. A terrifying dream in which he was surrounded by choking green sea. There was no up or down, only sourceless light all around and a host of slicing shadows. Sharks, each one with the lifeless black eyes of Pryrades. As the sea slid away, Darinoff broke surface, flailing up out of sleep into bleary half-wakefulness. The walls of the guard barracks were spotted with cold moonlight and the steady breathing of the other men was like the wind pushing through dry leaves. Even as his heart fluttered swiftly in his breast, he felt sleep reaching out again to reclaim his exhausted soul, soothing him with feathery fingers, whispering voicelessly in his ear. He began to slide back the tidal pull of dream gentler than before. This time it carried him toward a brighter place, a place of morning damp and gentle noontime sun, his father's freeholding in Hewenshire, where he had grown up working in the fields beside his sisters and older brother. A part of him had not left the barracks. It was before dawn, he knew, the ninth day of Yuvin, but another part had fallen back into the past. Again he smelled the musk of turned earth and heard the patient creaking of the plow traces and the measured chirp of cartwheels as the ox pulled the wagon down the road toward market. The creaking became louder, even as the pungent, muddy smell of the furrows began to fade. The plow was coming closer. The wain sounded to be just behind. Were the ox drivers asleep? Had someone let the oxen wander trampling into the fields? He felt a childish horror. My dad will be right mad. Was me? Was I supposed to watch him? He knew how his father would look, the puckered, rage-mottled face that would hear no excuse. The face young Darnoth had always thought of God sending a sinner down to hell. Mother, Elysia, that's going to get a strop to me, sure. He sat upright on his pallet, breathing hard. His heart was stumbling as badly as after the shark dream, but... It began to slow as he looked around the barracks. How long have you been dead, father? He wondered, wiping the swiftly cooling sweat from his forehead with his wrist. Why do you haunt me still? Have not the years and prayers? Darnoth suddenly felt a cold finger of fear trace his spine. He was awake now, was he not? Then why hadn't the remorseless, creaking noise disappeared with his half-dream? He was on his feet in a moment, shouting, dead father's ghost blown out like a candle. Up, men! Up! To arms! The siege has begun! Struggling into his mail coat, he went down the line of cots, kicking wakefulness into the groggy and wine-addled, calling instructions to those whom his first cry had brought suddenly to life. There were shouts of alarm from the gatehouse above and the ragged bleat of a trumpet. His helmet sat askew on his head, and his shield thumped his side as he trotted out the door, struggling with his sword belt. Poking his head into the other barracks room, he saw the denizens already up and swiftly arming themselves. Ho! Oh, Naglamunders! he called, waving a fist while he held the belt closed with the other. Now the test, God love us, now the test. He smiled at the ragged shout that answered him and headed for the stairs, straightening his helmet. The top of the greater gatehouse and the western curtain wall looked strangely misshapen by the light of the half moon overhead. The hoardings had been finished only days before, wooden walls and roof that would protect the defenders from arrows. 
Already the top of the gatehouse was swarming with partially dressed guards, flitting forms weirdly banded by the moonbeams that bled past the hoarding walls. Torches bloomed along the wall as archers and pikemen took their positions. Another trumpet squalled like a rooster who had despaired of dawn's arrival, summoning more soldiers out to the courtyard below. The shrill protest of wooden wheels grew louder. Dernoth started out across the, stared out across the denuded, down-sloping plain before the town wall, looking for the source of the noise, knowing what it would be, but still unprepared for the actual sight. God's bloody tree, he swore, and heard the man beside him repeat the oath. Moving toward them as slowly as hobbled giants, taking form out of the pre-dawn shadows, were six great siege towers, their wooden summits fully as high as Naglaman's mighty curtain wall. Hung all over in dark hides, they slouched forward like tree-tall, square-headed bears, the grunts and cries of the hidden men who pushed them, and the screech of the wheels big as houses seemed the voices of monsters unseen since the eldest days. Dernoth felt a not unpleasant rush of fear. The king had come at last, and now his army was at their door. By the good God, people would sing of this some day, whatever happened. Save your arrows, fools! he shouted as a few of the defenders launched wild shots into the darkness, the missiles falling far short of their still distant targets. Wait! 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 Soon enough they'll be closer than you'll like. Elias's army, in response to the flowering of fire on Naglaman's walls, let their drums thunder out through the darkness, a great rolling rumble that gradually resolved into a plodding two-part tread as of Titan footsteps. The defenders blew horns from every tower, a faint and tinny sound against the crash of the drums, but one that nevertheless, nonetheless, betokened life and resistance. Darenoth felt a touch at his shoulder and looked up to see two armored shapes beside him, bare-helmeted Izorn and glowing Einskalder in a cap of steel, unadorned but for a metal beak that hooked down over the nose. The dark-bearded Rimmersman's eyes burned like the torchlight as he laid a firm hand on his master's Grimner's son, moves, moving Izorn carefully but forcibly out of the way so he could stride to the parapet. Staring out into the dimness, Einskaldir growled dog-like under his breath. There, he snarled, pointing to the base of the bases of the siege towers. At the big bear's, at the big bear's feet! The stone chuckers and the ram. He indicated other large engines moving in the wake of the towers. Several were catapults, long, strong arms cocked back like the heads of startled snakes. Others seemed merely hide-covered boxes, their workings hidden by their armor, designed to come safely, like hard-shelled crabs, through the arrows and stones to the wall, where they would perform whatever tasks they had been assigned. "'Where's the prince?' Dernoth asked, unable to tear his eyes from the crawling engines. "'Coming,' Izorn replied, standing on his toes to try to look over Einskaldir. "'He has been with Jarnauga and the archive master since you returned from the parley. "'I hope they are preparing some wondrous device to give us strength or to sap the kings. "'It's truth, Dernoth. Look at them all.' He pointed at the dark, swarming shapes of the king's army, numerous as ants behind the slow-rolling towers. They are so damnably many. Adon's wounds, Einskaldir were snarled and turned a red eye back on Izorn. Let them come. We will eat them and spit them out. There, said Darenoth, and hoped he had made a smile come to his face, as he intended. With God the prince and <laughs> Einskaldir, what have we to fear? The king's army came onto the flatlands in the trail of siege engines, swarming over the mist-soaked meadows like flies on a green apple skin. Tents seemed to push up everywhere from the moist earth like angular mushrooms. 
Dawn came quietly as the besiegers moved into place. The hidden sun peeled away only a single layer of night's darkness, leaving the world suspended in directionless gray light. The great siege towers, which had stood in place for a long hour, like dozing sentries, suddenly moved forward again. Soldiers dodged in and out among the mighty wheels, heaving on the guy ropes as the massive engines rolled laboriously uphill. At last they came within range. The archers on the walls let fly, shouting with terrified joy when the arrows went hissing out as though they let go the tight tethers on their hearts with the bowstrings. After the first wobbly barrage, they began to find the range. Many of the king's men dropped dead in their tracks or lay wounded as the remorseless wheels of their own engines ground them, screaming into the turf. But for every one who fell, arrow pierced, another of the helmeted and blue-jacketed engineers leaped forward to take up his guy rope. The siege towers rumbled on toward the walls, undeterred. <coughs> Now the king's archers on the ground were close enough to return fire. Arrows flickered back and forth between the walls and the earth below like maddened bees. As the engines rattled and creaked toward the curtain wall, the sun broke through for a short moment. Already the battlements were red-sprinkled in places, as if with a gentle rain. Dareneth! The soldier's white face, dirt streaked, shone within his helmet like a full moon. Grimstead bids you come, and soon they have brought ladders against the wall below Dendinus's tower. This tree! Dernoth clenched his teeth in frustration and turned to look for Izorn. The Rimmersman had taken a bow from a wounded guardsman and was helping to clear the last few ells of ground between the nearest siege tower and the wall skewering any soldier fool enough to come out from the stalled tower's protective skirts and try and take up the loose guy ropes fluttering in the wind. Izorn, Dernoth shouted, while we keep the towers at bay, they bring ladders to the southwest wall. Go then, as Grimner's son did not look up from his arrow tip. I will join you when I may. But where is it? Where is Ein Skalder? From the corner of his eye, he saw the messenger jigging up and down in fearful impatience. God knows! Cursing again under his breath, Dernoth lowered his head and ran clumsily along behind Sir Grimstade's messenger. He gathered half a dozen guardsmen as he went, tired men who had slumped down for a moment in the lee of the battlement to catch their breath. Summoned, they shook their heads regretfully, but donned their helms and followed. Dernoth was well trusted. Many called him the prince's right hand. But, but Jazua had poor luck with his first right hand, Dernoth thought sourly as he hunched along the walkway, sweating despite the cold gray air. I hope he keeps this one longer. And where is the prince anyway? Of all times he should be seen. Rounding the great bulk of Dendinus's tower, he was shocked to see Sir Grimstead's men falling back, and the swarming blue-red and blue colors of Baron Godwig's Kellodshire men pouring over the battlement onto the curtain wall. For Joshua! he shouted, leaping forward. The men behind him echoed his cry. They came against the besiegers with a tinny crash of sword on sword, and for a moment, pushed the shireman back. One toppled from the wall, shrieking, windmilling his arms as though the chill wind might bear him up. Grimstead's men took heart and pushed forward. While the enemy was engaged again, Dernoff pulled a pike from the stiff grasp of a sprawled corpse, suffering a hard blow to his body from a stray spear butt, and pushed the first of the tall ladders away from the wall. A moment later, two of his guardsmen had joined him, and together... They levered the ladder out. It went shivering into open space as the besiegers on it clung and cursed, their mouths gaping like black empty holes. For a moment it stood free, halfway between earth and heaven and perpendicular to both. Then the ladder overbalanced backward toward the ground below, 
shedding soldiers like fruit from a shaken branch. Soon all but a pair of the red and blue lay in their blood on the walkway. The defenders pushed the remaining three ladders away, and Grimstead had his men roll up one of the large stones they had not had time to move at the assault's beginning. They tipped it over the low spot on the wall so that it went crashing down on the toppled ladders, splintering them like kindling and killing one of the ladder men who sat where he had tumbled, staring idiotically as the great stone rolled down upon him. One of the defending guardsmen, a bearded young fellow who had diced with Darenoth once, lay dead, his neck broken by the edge of a shield. Four of Sir Grimstead's men had also fallen, crumpled like wind-toppled scarecrows, among seven men of Kaladshire, who also had not survived the failed assault. Darenoth was feeling the blow to his stomach and stood panting as gap-toothed Grimstead leaped over to stand beside him, a ragged, bloody hole in the calf of his boot. "'Tis seven here, and half a dozen more tumbled off the ladder," the knight said, staring down with satisfaction on the writhing bodies and wreckage below. All down the wall, it's the same. Losing far more than we, King Elias says, far more. Darenoth felt ill, and his wounded shoulder throbbed as though a nail had been driven into it. The king has far more than we do, he replied. He can toss them away like apple peelings. Now he knew he would be sick and moved toward the edge of the wall. Apple peelings he said again, and leaned over the parapet, too pained to feel shame. Next section. Read it again, please, Yanauga said quietly, staring at his knitted fingers. Father Strangyard looked up, his weary mouth open to form a question. Instead, a bone-jarring thump from outside brought a look of panic to the one-eyed priest's face, and he quickly traced a tree on the breast of his black robe. Stones, he said, his voice shrilled. They, they, are, they are throwing stones over the wall. Shouldn't we? Isn't there? The men fighting atop the walls are in danger too, the old rimmer's garter said, his face stern. We are here because we best serve here. Our comrades search for one sword in the white north, against lethal odds. Another is in the hands of our enemy already, even as he besieges our walls. What little hope there is of discovering what happened to Fingal's blade, Minea, lies with us. His expression softened as he regarded the worried Strangyard. The few stones that reach the inner keep must come over the high wall behind this room. We are at little risk. Now, please read the passage again. There is something in it I cannot quite touch, but that seems important. The tall priest stared down at the page for some moments, and as the room fell into silence, a wave of cries and exhortations, muffled by distance, stole through the window like a mist. Strangyard's mouth twitched. "'Read,' suggested Yarnauga. The priest cleared his throat. "'And so John went down into the tunnels beneath the hayhold, "'steaming vents and sweating passageways alive with the breath of Shurakai, "'unarmed but for a spear, and shield his very boot leather, "'smoking as he neared the fire drake's den,' He was, there is little doubt, as frightened as he ever would be in his long life. Strangyard broke off. Why, what use is this, Yarnauga? Something thudded into the soil a short distance away with a sound like the fall of a giant's hammer. Strangyard stoically ignored it. Do, do you want me to go on? Through all King John's battle with the dragon? No. Yarnauga waved a gnarled hand. Go to the ending passage. The priest carefully turned a few leaves. 
Thus it, it was that he came out again into the light beyond any hope of return. Those few who had remained at the cave mouth, this itself an indication of great bravery, for who could know what might happen at the door of an angered dragon's tunnel, swore great oaths of joy and astonishment. Joy when they saw John of Werenstein come up alive from the worm's den, and astonishment at the massive claw, crimson-scaled and hook-taloned, that he bore upon his bloody shoulder. As they went, shouting down the road before him, leading his horse triumphantly through the gates of Urchester, the people came gaping to their windows and into the streets, some say that those who had loudest prophesied John's horrible death and the dire consequences to themselves of the young knight's actions were now most audible in their acclaim of his great deed. As word spread, the rows were quickly lined with clamoring citizens who threw flowers before John as he rode. Bright nail lifted high before him like a torch flame through the city that was now his own. Sighing, Strangyard gently put the manuscript pages back into the cedar box he had found to house them. A lovely and frightening story, I would say, Yarnalva, and Morgenes. Hmm. Yes, he puts things wonderfully, but what use to us? Uh, no disrespect, you understand. Yarnauga squinted at his own prominent knuckles and frowned. I do not know. Something, there is something there. Dr. Morgenis, whether he wished to or no, put something there. Sky and clouds and stones, I can almost touch it. I feel blind. Another wash of noise came through the window. Loud, worried shouts and the weighty chink of armor as a troop of guards jogged past in the commons outside. I do not think we have long to ponder, Yarnauga, Strangyard said finally. Nor do I, said the old man and rubbed his eyes. Okay, next section. Let me just make sure nobody has told me that I'm off. Okay. No, I seem to still be on, and that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. All through the afternoon, the tide of King Elias's army dashed itself against Naglaman's stony cliffs. The weak sunlight struck glinting shards of reflection from polished metal as wave after wave of mailed and helmeted soldiers swarmed up the ladders, only to be repelled by the castle's defenders. Here and there, the king's forces found a momentary breach in the ring of stern men and grudging stone, but they were always pushed back. Fat Ordmeyer, baron of Uttersal, held one such gap alone for long minutes, battling hand to hand with the scaling soldiers mounting the ladders from below, slaying four of them and keeping the rest at bay until help arrived, although he got his own death wound in the fighting. It was Prince Joshua himself who brought up a troop of guards, securing the length of wall and destroying the ladder. Joshua's sword, Nidel, was a ray of sunlight flickering through leaves, snicking swiftly in and out, making dead men from living while his attackers swung clumsy broadswords or inadequate daggers. The prince cried when Ordmeyer's body was found. There had been no love lost between the Baron and himself, but Ordmeyer's death had been a heroic one, and in the pulse of battle his fall suddenly seemed to Joshua representative of all the others. All the pikemen and archers and foot soldiers on both sides dying in their own blood beneath cold, cloudy skies. The prince ordered that the Baron's great limp bulk be carried down to the castle chapel. His guardsmen, cursing silently, complied. As the reddening sun crawled toward the western horizon, King Elias's army seemed to sag, to let up, 
Their attempts to push the siege engines against the curtain wall in the hissing face of arrow fire grew half-hearted, and the scalers began to abandon their ladders at the first resistance from the heights above. It was hard for Urkenlander to kill Urkenlander, even at the High King's command. It was harder still when those brother Urkenlanders fought like denned badgers. As sunset came on, a mournful horn blast floated across the field from the lines of tents, and Elias's forces began to fall back, dragging the wounded and also many of the dead, leaving the hide-covered siege towers and miners' frames where they stood, awaiting the next morning's assault. As the horn sounded again, the drums beat loudly, as though to remind the defenders that the king's great army, like the green ocean, could send waves forever. Eventually, the drums seemed to say, even the stubbornest stone would crumble. The siege towers, standing like solitary obelisks before the walls, were another obvious reminder of Elias's intent to return. The damp hides hung upon them permitted no mere flaming arrow to do damage, but Aidgram, the Lord Constable, had been pondering all day. After seeking some advice from Yarnauga and Strangyard, he had at last devised a plan. Silently, even as the last of the king's men limped down the slope toward their encampment, Agram bade his men load oil-filled wine sacks onto the throwing arms of Naglaman's two small sling stones. When the arms were released, the oil sacks whistled across the open space beyond the wall to splatter over the tower's leather mantling. This done, it was a simple matter to send a few fiery pitch-tipped arrows streaking through the blue twilight. Within moments, the four huge towers had become billowing torches. There was nothing the king's men could do to quell the blaze. The defenders on the walls clapped their hands together and stamped and shouted, weary but heartened, as orange light danced on the battlements. When King Elias rode out from the camp, wrapped in his great black cloak like a man of shadows, Naglaman's defenders jeered. When he lifted his strange gray sword and shouted like a madman for rain to fall and quench the fiery towers, they laughed uneasily. It was only after a while, as the king rode back and forth, crow-black crow cape flapping in the cold wind, that they began to understand from the horrible anger in Elias's echoing voice that he truly expected rain to come at his summoning, and that he was outraged it had not. The laughter faded into a fearful silence. Naglaman's defenders, one by one, left off their celebrating and climbed down from the walls to tend their wounds. The siege, after all, had barely begun. There was no respite in view, and no rest this side of heaven. Next section. I've been having strange dreams again, Binabek. Simon had ridden his horse up alongside Kantaka, some yards ahead of the rest of the company. It was clear but terribly cold, this their sixth day riding across the white waste. Dreams of what sort? Simon readjusted the mask the troll had made him, a strip of hide with a slit cut in it to mask the fierce glare of the snow. A green angel tower, or some tower, Last night I dreamed that it was running with blood. Binibic squinted behind his own mask, then pointed to a faint band of gray running along the horizon at the base of the mountains. That, I am sure, is the edge of the Dimmerskog, or the Kilakitsuk, as my folk properly name it, the Shadow Wood. We should be upon it with another day or so. Staring at the dreary strip, Simon felt his frustrations boiling up. I don't care about the damnable forest, he snapped, and I'm sick to death of ice and snow, ice and snow. We shall freeze and die in this awful wilderness. 
What about the dreams I'm having? The troll bobbed along for a moment as Kantaka made her way over a series of small drifts. Through the song of the wind, Haystan could be heard shouting something to someone. I am already full of sorrow. Binnebeck spoke measuredly as if matching his speech to the cadence of their progress. Awake I lay two nights in Naglumon, worrying what harm I would do in bringing you along for this journey. I have no knowledge of what your dreams mean, and the only way uh, for finding it would be to walk the road of dreams. As we did at Jaloy's house, but I am having no faith in my unaided powers for that. Not here. Not now. It is possible your dreams could give us aid, but still I do not find it wise to walk the dream road now. Here we all are then, and this is what our fate will be. I can only say I have been doing what seemed best. Simon thought about this and grunted. Here we all are. Binnebeck is right. Here we all are, too far in to turn back. Is in... He made the sign of the tree with fingers trembling from more than chill. Is the Storm King the devil? He asked at last. Binnebeck frowned deeply. The devil? The enemy of your god? Why are you asking that? You have heard Yarnauga's words. You know what Ineluki is. I suppose, he shivered, it's just that I see him in my dreams. I think it's him, anyway. Red eyes. That's all I see, really, and everything else black. Like burned up logs with the hot places still showing through. He felt ill just remembering. The troll shrugged, hands caught up in the wolf's neck ruff. He is not your devil, friend Simon. He is evil, though, or at least I am thinking that the things he wants will be evil for the rest of us. That is evil enough. And the dragon, Simon said hesitantly a moment later, Binnebeck turned his head sharply, presenting his strange, slitted gaze. Dragon? The one who lives on the mountain. The one whose name I can't say. Binnebeck laughed explosively, his breath a cloud. Ikjarjuk is its name. Daughter of the mountains, you are having many worries, young friend. Devils. Dragons. He caught one of his own tears on the finger of his glove and held up. Look, he chuckled, as if there was need of making more ice. But there was a dragon, Simon answered hotly. Everyone said so. Long ago, Simon. It is an ill-omened place. But that is being as much for its isolation as anything else is my guessing. Kanuk legends tell a great ice worm lived there once, and my people do not go there, but now I think it to be more likely a, a haunt of snow leopards and such creatures. Not that there will not be things of danger. The Hunen, as we are well-knowing range, far afield these days. <coughs> so... Then truly I have little to fear? The most terrible things have been running through my head at night. I was not saying you had little to fear, Simon. We must never be forgetting that we have enemies. Some, it would seem, are very, very powerful indeed. Another frigid night in the waste. Another campfire in the dark emptiness of the surrounding snow fields. Simon would have liked nothing better in the entire world than to be curled up in a bed at Naglamond, 
covered in blankets, even if the bloodiest battle in the history of Ostenard raged just outside his door. He was sure that if just now someone offered him a warm, dry place to sleep, he would lie or kill or take Usairi's name in vain to get it. He was positive as he sat wrapped in his saddle blanket, trying to keep his teeth from chattering, that he could feel his very eyelashes freezing on his lids. Wolves were yipping and wailing in the unending darkness beyond the faint firelight, carrying on long and mournfully intricate conversations. Two nights before, when the companions had first begun to hear their singing, Kantaka spent the entire evening pacing nervously around the campfire circle. She had since grown used to the night cries of her fellows and only responded with an occasional uneasy whimper. Why dunna she talk b b back at him? Haystan asked worriedly. A plainsman of the Urkenlandish far north, he had no more love for wolves than did Sludig, although he had grown almost fond of Binibix Mount. Why dunna she tell him? Why dunna she tell him to go p p plague someone else? Like men, not all tribes of Kentaka's kind are at peace, Binibic replied, setting no one's mind at ease. Tonight the great she-wolf was doing her stalwart best to ignore the howling, pretending sleep but giving herself away as her pricked ears swiveled toward the louder cries. The wolf song, Simon decided as he huddled deeper in his blanket, was about the loneliest sound he had ever heard. Why am I here? he wondered. Why are any of us here, searching through this horrible snow for some sword no one has even thought about in years? Meanwhile, the princess and all the rest of them are back at the castle waiting for the king to attack. Stupid! Binibit grew up in the mountains, in the snow. Grimrick and Hastan and Sludig are soldiers. The Adon alone knows what the Sithi want. So why am I here? It's stupid. The howling quieted. A long forefinger touched Simon's hand, making him jump. Do you listen to the wolves, Saoman? Jariki asked. It's hard not to. They sing such fierce songs. The Sitha shook his head. They are like your mortal kind. They sing of where they have been and what they have seen and scented. They tell each other where the elk are running and who has taken whom to mate. But mostly they are crying, I am, here I am. Jariki smiled, veiling his eyes as he watched the dying fire. And th that's what you think we m m mortals are saying? With words and without them, the prince responded. You must try to see things with our eyes. To the Zidaya, your folk often seem as children. You see that the long-lived Sithi do not sleep, that we stay awake throughout the long night of history. You men, like children, wish to remain at the fire with your elders, to hear the songs and stories and watch the dancing. He gestured around as though the darkness was peopled with invisible revelers. But you cannot, Simon, he continued kindly. You may not. It is given to your folk to sleep the final sleep, just as it is given to our kind to walk and sing beneath the stars the night long. Perhaps there is even a richness in your sleeping dreams that we Zidaya do not understand. The stars hanging in the black crystal sky seem to slide away to sink deeper into the vast night. Simon thought of the Sithi, and of a life that did not end, and could not make himself understand what it might be like. Chilled to the bone, even it seemed to his soul, he leaned close to the fire, pulling off his damp mittens to warm his hands. But the Sithi 
can die, can't they? He asked cautiously, cursing his frozen, stuttering speech. Jeriki leaned close, his eyes narrowing, and for a frightening moment Simon thought the Sitha was going to strike him for his temerity. Instead, Jeriki took Simon's trembling hand and tilted it. Your ring, he said, staring at the fish-shaped curlicue. I had not seen it before. Who gave you this? My master, I suppose he was, Simon stammered. Dr. Morganis of the Hayhole. He sent it after me to Binnebic. The cool, strong clutch of the Sithi prince's hand was unsettling, but he dared not pull away. So you are one of your kind who knows the secret? Jeriki asked, watching him intently. The depth of his golden eyes, rust-tinged by the fire's reflection, was frightening. Secret? N n no, no, I don't know any secret. Jeriki stared at him for a moment, holding him still with his eyes as surely as if he had grasped Simon's head in both hands. Then why should he give you the ring? Jeriki asked, mostly to himself, shaking his head as he released Simon's hand. And I myself gave you a white arrow. The ancestors have made for us a strange road indeed. He turned back to stare at the wavering fire and would not answer Simon's questions. Secrets, Simon thought angrily. More secrets. Binnebic has them. Morgenes had them. The Sithi are full of them. I don't want to know about any other secrets. Why have I been picked out for this punishment? Why is everyone forever forcing their horrible secrets on me? He cried silently for a while, hugging his knees and shivering, wishing for impossible things. They reached the eastern outskirts of the Dimmerskog on the afternoon of the next day. Although the forest was covered in a thick blanket of white snow, it nevertheless seemed, as Binnebic had named it, a place of shadows. The company did not pass beneath its eaves, and might have chosen not to even had their path lain that way, so thick with foreboding was the wood's atmosphere. The trees, despite their size, and some of them were huge indeed, seemed dwarfish and twisted as though they squirmed bitterly beneath their burden of needled branches and snow. The open spaces between the contorted trunks seemed to bend away crazily like tunnels dug by some huge and drunken mole, leading at last to dangerous, secretive depths. Passing in near silence, his horse's hooves crunching softly in the snow, Simon imagined following the gaping pathways into the bark-pillared, white-roofed halls of Dimmerskog, coming at last to... Who could guess? Perhaps to the dark, malicious heart of the forest, a place where the trees breathed together and passed endless rumors with a scaly rub of branch on branch, or the malicious exhalation of wind through trees, through twigs and frozen leaves. They camped that night in the open again, even though the Dimmerskog crouched only a short distance away like a sleeping animal. None of them wanted to spend a night beneath the forest branches, especially Sludig, who had been raised on stories of the ghastly things that stalked the wood's pale corridors. The Sithi did not seem to care, but Jeriki spent part of the evening oiling his dark witchwood sword. Again the company huddled around a naked fire, and the east wind razored past them all the long evening, sending great powdery spouts of snow whirling all around and sporting among the Dimmerskog's upper reaches. When they lay down that night to sleep, it was to the sound of the forest creaking and the wind-ridden branches sawing one against the other. And that's where we're going to stop for tonight, because it's the end of a section, although it's certainly not the end of a chapter. So let me just check to see if we seem to be still online. Yes, we do still, still seem to be. So, <clears throat> excuse me, with that, I will wrap it up.
for the night. I will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. my time. And if you can't make that, I will, of course, be back at this same time slot next week, I think. Yeah, I can't think of any reason why not. That would be September, uh, February the 12th. So, yeah, nothing going on. No holidays, no nothing I'd have to deal with. So, that being the case, I thank you for joining me. Um, I hope that went the whole way through. Again, it's hard to tell now because I'm working on two different screens at the same time. But uh, as far as I know, I don't see any people saying, oh my God, we lost him again or anything like that. So that's a good thing. And um, I will then therefore, then therefore, I will say, thank you so much for being with me. I will see you again very soon. Um, Lily rises from her, her, her bed of slumber to say good night also or good morning. And uh, take good care of yourselves. Please do take good care of your loved ones um, and take good care of the people around you whenever you can. And we will all take care of each other. And that way we will march on to victory or something anyway. So with that, peace. Good night. See you soon.